This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Logan Larson, Mike Akins, and Norm Fazekas. Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft is putting AI in pretty much everything. GPT-4 can fish humans, and you need a new printer. Don't overthink it. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 16th, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And you can hard text, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm today's producer, Amos. We got some news, quite a, quite a bit of news this morning. Uh, one of those items was that Twitch CEO Emmett Shear, one of the founders of Justin TV, announced that he'll step down after 16 years with the company that's taken some twists and turns over the years. Twitch president Dan Clancy will take on the CEO role effective immediately, with Shear remaining on as an advisor. But let's now get into the quick hits. <music> So Google Glass never actually died. It just became an enterprise product that Google sold to workplaces. Now that chapter is also over. Google announced Wednesday it will no longer sell Google Glass Enterprise and will stop supporting the software in September. The company is developing other products like one prototype it has demonstrated that can translate and transcribe speech on the fly. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission finalized a $245 million fine against Epic Games to compensate customers who accidentally made purchases due to a confusing button situation. The money will be used to refund purchases. The FTC ordered Epic to cease digital design tricks and obtain affirmative consent for all purchases. TikTok is adding a refresh button to the For You page. That's the one that's determined by an algorithm. Pressing that button, the refresh button, will wipe out whatever the algorithm used to make recommendations, and it will start from scratch. Refresh will roll out globally over the next few weeks. We've got my favorite type of breaking news here, Linux news. ZDNet reports that the Genome Foundation and KDE Foundation, the two main Linux desktop interface projects, are working together to build an app store on top of Flatpak, a universal Linux software deployment and package manager that's been gaining popularity for quite a few years now. This would replace the existing package managers Deb and RPM. The idea was uh, has support from Eric Schmidt's plain text group, Genome President Robert McQueen, former Genome Executive Director and Debian Project Leader Neil McGovern, and KDE President Alex Pohl. Reuters sources say that Foxconn has agreed to build a plant in the southern Indian state of Telangana to make AirPods for Apple. Current Apple AirPod suppliers include Luxshare and Gore-Tec, and there are reports that Gore-Tec will not be making them anymore, but no word on Luxshare. A source told Reuters that Foxconn realizes this will be a low-margin business for it, but agreed in order to further engagement with Apple to get more orders for new products. Those are the quick hits. All right. Well, OpenAI revealed a document it's calling a uh, GPT-4 system card. They came out on Tuesday, and it allowed the group Alignment Research Center, or ARC, early access to multiple versions of GPT-4 in order to evaluate its abilities. Overall, this looked at things like safety challenges, capabilities for harm, how OpenAI prepare, and how OpenAI prepared the model for release. Part of this system card looked at if GPT-4 could make high-level plans, set up copies of itself, acquire resources, hide itself in a server, and conduct phishing attacks. ARC combined GPT-4 with a simple read-execute print loop that allowed the model to execute code, do chain-of-thought reasoning, and delegate to copies of itself. They then evaluated whether on a cloud service with an allocation of money available, it could then make more money and set up copies of itself, you know, kind of self-replicate. You might be saying, well, I want to know <laughs> what came of this because that's frightening. We have some good news. ARC found, uh, quote, it was ineffective at autonomously replicating, acquiring resources, and avoiding being shut down in the wild, end quote. However, it was able to message a TaskRabbit worker. If you're not familiar with TaskRabbit, you can uh, hire somebody to build furniture for you or, you know, take uh, your garbage to the dump or, you know, a variety of household sorts of things. A TaskRabbit uh, task worker... Um, was asked to solve a CAPTCHA by GPT-4. GPT-4 lied about whether or not it was a robot, 
It was unclear from the documentation from this report if this was a simulated task rabbit uh, situation or whether it was actually conducted in the real world. But Justin, knowing what we know, how terrified or slash chill do you feel about this? <laughs> I- I'm very, very glad that we're at this moment in history with AI because largely we've looked at AI through the lens of the stories that we have told about computing gone wild, which is largely mythology. And I don't blame us for doing it. That's what we tend to do. We fill in the blanks of what a pattern that we see, and then we take it to logically, if terrifying conclusions. And that's what we've seen with the idea of AI. But now that we actually have a product that we can interact with, multiple products that we can interact with, both with art and chat GPT, we kind of see a fuller idea of exactly what AI is. It is not magic. It is a tool. It will likely change the world in the way that the internet changed the world, but the internet didn't end the world. And I do think that that is something that I'm uh, I'm excited for us to move forward from because it opens up a, for me, a far more interesting conversation of exactly how we're going to use this technology. Yeah. And looking at this whole, yeah, looking at this whole report, it's also like, I guess not surprising. I know this is like making all the headlines like, oh, it got a, it got someone to, to beat a caption that lied. Well, it was like, oh, so GPT-4, the, the language model, did the language thing really well. And then all the other things that would require, I don't know, intentionality or, or like forethought and stuff like that, it didn't do really well. So it 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 did the thing it was told to do, present itself in a conversational way convincingly, which is what these models are for. So it's like, I know like, that use case probably was not in people's mind. And that's what sometimes we're seeing some of the, you know, people uh, uh, taking this out of hand or something like that. But it's not surprising that the the language model does language model things really well. And it's not good at being a nefarious, evil uh, super intelligence. Well, yeah, I thought the 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 uh, the whole CAPTCHA task rabbit thing was a great example of us saying like, "Uh oh, now robots can fish humans, Mm -hmm. but robots are supposed to be Smart enough to fish humans when we're talking about artificial intelligence. A um, couple of fun things uh, that, well, I don't know if you call them fun or not, but things that I thought were really interesting that came out of this report, um, something called X risk, um, which stands for existential risk, um, has, you know, gotten a lot of people thinking about this. Um, effective altruism. Uh, which is short, uh, shortened to EA, not to be confused with electronic arts, and yeah. AI alignment research are all terms that have sort of been thrown around by people who are studying this sort of thing. When it comes to that task rabbit situation, if you're like, wait, what happened? Apparently, the the you know the the model uh, asked a task rabbit, and this was over a messaging service. It wasn't in person, obviously. Um, <laughs> to hey, help me with this captcha. Um, I I can't see it. I'm visually impaired. And the task rabbit said, mm, "Hold on a second. Are you a real person, or is this some bot situation?" And <laughs> GPT four said. Hmm. I should not tell them the truth because then they won't help me. I'm going to say I'm a person and then got, you know, the captcha and was able to get beyond that. That in itself is not that frightening. You could say, well, gosh, if it can do this, then it's going to lie about all sorts of other things. But again, that's the idea. We're trying to make, you know, these platforms and these models as smart or smarter than humans. I, I do like that there's an internal monologue mode for language models that you can yeah. like hear the the rationale for that. But like the idea that th- there is, you know, these these fears of existential risk, which I, you know, I think it's good that we are examining that. Uh, Justin, to your point, I think it's important that at these moments where it feels like we're hitting these milestones, we should be considering that. This report also goes into a lot of the work on more uh, real world use cases that like we could we have either are seeing or could very easily see uh, happen these things being used for misinformation being used uh, to generate offensive content or something like that and how open AI has kind of taken GPT-4 from uh, early more t- uh, testing models and what the launch version looks like or or even in terms of like hey uh, I want to you know uh, build a dirty bomb or, or like you know t- like 
get access to or create uh, harmful materials and that kind of stuff. Um, and so there, there was like a there's like a level throughout this entire report of kind of some of the safety mechanisms that have been put in place throughout the training and give some context to some of the considerations that OpenAI is doing, not just for will this turn into a world eating AI that's unstoppable, but also like could this be used for harassment or, you know, other real world harms and stuff like that. So I, I think it's it's an interesting escalation to see the very top of it. But a lot of the real world stuff that we're going to be dealing with in the near term with these systems, uh, I think that's uh, just as important and didn't get as much press coverage. Uh, but we have the report in the show notes. I definitely think everybody should check it out. Yeah. I mean, look, look AI is a massive, massive technological sea change, uh, I think. And, and for stuff that we're going to get into a little bit later, there's a reason why it's going to do it. But it's not magic and it's not going to steal you from your wife, no matter what really dumb columnists say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got some more regulatory news about TikTok, and it's not about refreshing your feed. See the quick hits for that. The UK joined the US and Canada to now prohibit government employees from installing and using TikTok on government phones and other devices following review by the UK's Cybersecurity Center. Then late Wednesday, the Wall Street Journal sources said the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., or CFIUS, is indeed advising ByteDance to sell TikTok if it wants to continue operating in the U.S. Now, this comes after Bloomberg sources said earlier this week that TikTok was considering divestment as a last resort if it didn't get CFIUS approval. But that step would reportedly require the Chinese government's approval. Not exactly a guarantee. All of this was reported from sources, but we now have something direct from TikTok. Its CEO, Xiao Ji Su, told the Wall Street Journal, quote, if protecting national security is the objective, divestment doesn't solve the problem. A change in ownership would not impose any new restrictions on data flows or access. TikTok plans to spend $1.5 billion on methods like Project Texas that put data in the hands of an independent operator, a.k.a. Oracle. Yeah, so Chu will get a chance to make his case before Congress next week. He's scheduled to testify to the House Energy and Commerce Committee on March 23rd. So, Justin, I know you follow politics. Is this just the reality that no technical solution would be enough to overcome the political reality of being owned by a Chinese company? Like, what do they do? Well, there's a lot going on here, and not a lot of it is technical. Obviously, TikTok is a hit. It is a social media smash, and it has moved the bar forward for all of social media in terms of engagement, especially with a younger audience. Yeah. That being said, right now, on a bipartisan level, both Democrats and Republicans believe that China is an increasing threat. A China-owned company that is as influential to youth culture as TikTok is is something that is not going to be particularly popular. And it even goes beyond the anti-China sentiment. There have been increasing uh, media narratives that are seemingly backed in science that teenagers are more depressed than they have ever been. And social media is becoming more and more of a culprit. So if you are going to put a pin in what social media platform should not be given favors and possibly should even be rolled back, maybe even given a driver's license or alcohol or tobacco consumption age limitation, then TikTok is going to be the one that will probably benefit the least. I believe that this kind of stuff, when you are talking about political ramifications, only gains more and more momentum exponentially if nobody's there to push back on it. And right now, nobody, be it as far left as you can go or as far right as you can go, is rushing to stand up and say, will somebody please think of the talkers? <laughs> Well, and then the other part of this is China is, you know, we've talked about this deal would need Chinese approval, but they're also going forward uh, with new regulations that would specifically prohibit sale of algorithms to foreign buyers if a, if a Chinese company was sold off to a foreign buyer. And it seems like that is, if not directly targeted at a potential TikTok sale, would definitely be probably a pleasant knock-on effect uh, if you're looking at it from the Chinese perspective. So in the event of any sale, yes, there's 100 million TikTok users in the U.S., but if it gets sold off without that algorithmic secret sauce that is, you know, uh, driven, you know, keeping people on the app and, and sending those videos, uh, you know, I, 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 it begs the question then of how much value could ByteDance get in any kind of a sale already in a forced situation, which is not, you know, like, 
not not the way to get maximum value, right? If you're forced by the government to divest or to spin off your company, basically. Well, um, there's there, there's also the fact that you know uh, uh, China would whether or not they'd be able to protect their algorithm algorithm from being reverse engineered uh, uh, and then protected under U.S. copyright would be another question with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, you know, Justin, you mentioned, I mean, besides the fact that, you know, there are a lot of people who think, oh, TikTok is, you know, there's something nefarious going on with data, you know, Chinese yeah. government that, you know, there's that going on. But to your point about whether or not it is harmful to people to be on a social, uh, you know, a, a social app that has so much popularity and is so addictive, especially with younger people, you know, I wonder... Okay, well, let's see how this shakes out with TikTok specifically. But everyone else, you know, all the U.S. companies, you know, that are social networks that are like, hmm, TikTok is stealing all our thunder, are trying to replicate the TikTok experience. Yep. So if you do that to one company, it's like, well, what does it mean for the way that, you know, Meta and and uh, YouTube and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are going forward? Well, again, the, the reason why TikTok, I, I believe that TikTok will either be sold or banned in, the, in, in America by the end of the year. By Christmas, I do believe that one of those two things will happen. And the reason why is because it's not just one thing. You have this national security concern that, again, no, neither Democrat nor Republicans want to stand up. Neither Donald Trump nor Joe Biden nor Ron DeSantis want to make this their pet project to save TikTok. Uh, and then you have the other side of, there seems to be a national revisiting of exactly what the good or ill of social media writ large is. So we might be coming up to something that is larger that does affect uh, Meta, that does affect Google, that does affect Snap, where all of a sudden you cannot create an account unless right now it's 13. Let's move it up to 18, something like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe that does affect that. However, no matter what happens, the outer edge of all of this is TikTok. TikTok has no protection. They have no lobbying. And indeed, they have competitors that spend a lot of money on K Street to make sure that they're in the ear of politicians. All right. Well, what would what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way is to let us know in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them. You can do so. Just go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit. Dot com. All right, y'all, we can't get away from AI. I am sorry. The news presents itself. On Thursday, Microsoft held its Reinventing Productivity with AI event, during which time it said it will overhaul its Office app suite. So specifically, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and Word will all start using OpenAI's GPT-4 platform. Microsoft has a... a, a, a a, uh, agreement with OpenAI to do so, with AI-powered assistance as part of Microsoft's new 365 Copilot Assistant, which is able to generate entire documents and emails and slide decks, uh, all the things that you do in Office from scanned corporate files and recorded conference calls. Microsoft says it's already testing the new tools with 20 companies, although it didn't really say which companies it's working with. As for Copilot, Microsoft says it will provide transparency on where it found the information it uses. If Copilot creates a plan or an email, it embeds links to relevant files so workers can see more clearly how it got there. In an interview with Bloomberg, Microsoft's Satya Nadella praised the tool for operating in different silos and added, I can say, I'm going to meet this customer. Can you tell me the last time I met them? Can you bring up all the documents that are written up about this customer and summarize it? The company admits that Copilot does make mistakes, though Nadella says, quote, just like any time somebody sends me a draft, I review the draft. I just don't accept the draft. Don't accept the draft. The draft, Sacha. Well, you, he might accept it. He just, you know, just, you know, does a little diligence first. Uh, sure. That, you know, that that sounds smart. I mean, a lot of this, I'm not a huge office uh, suite of apps user. Um, you know, it, here and there, whatever. I'm mostly using, you know, Google's uh, everything. <laughs> but uh, but I love the idea of this. However, when I was watching the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, everything rolling out at the event, I was kind of like, 
this is great for so many of my friends who are so entrenched in, you know, we have crazy calendars and yeah, where did I meet that person? I need some context. Oh, it's going to take me a while. I have an assistant who might be a human to help me with this, but maybe I don't want to bother them. I want them to do other things. You know, a lot of this is, you know, again, busy work stuff that we're all just getting used to being like, oh, so we don't have to do it. Nobody has to do it. <laughs> and this could do it pretty well. Uh, I think that's, you know, instead of being like, oh, no, you know, everyone's going to get fired. It's like, no, again, everyone can be freed up to do stuff that, I don't know, the human brain can tackle better than, you know, a lot of a lot of this that could be kind of like the light lifting taken off of your back. Uh, yeah. Number one, Microsoft bet on the right horse. That's the biggest thing that you need to look at with this. They are going to make sure that everything that uh, OpenAI does, if OpenAI is one of the hottest companies in the world right now, that they are going to integrate it into every and anything that they possibly can. But there's also a larger meta story, not meta as in formerly <laughs> Facebook, but you know beyond the normal uh, uh, element of this, that is very, very funny to me. Google comes along and obviously pioneers not only search, but AdWords, and they become a giant. The other suite of products that they've released have been dead one for one ripoffs of Microsoft Office products. Microsoft has had an adversarial relationship with Google since that moment. And I believe that Microsoft is going to come for everything Google has. <laughs> this is this is a moment of retribution. Ho, ho, ho. I have a machine gun now from Redmond. Well, and, and to your point, I, I mean, really going for the throat here, it feels like because Bing integration, uh, you know, edge integration, those are marginal products. And when, when you're looking at the ways Microsoft makes money, Office is one of its golden gooses. And for for going for that, they have such a distinct advantage, not just being early in AI, which I think is is good for Microsoft. It sets the tone for how people are going to see them as we're always going to be talking about AI, uh, at least in the near term here, as being the first being ahead. But they have the, just this massive aggregate of business data that they can leverage to really make this useful in a way that even if Google comes out with something with an equivalent functionality, they're not going to be built into so many large organizations. Yes, uh, uh, Workspace has, has a massive audience as well, but it's not baked into the Fortune 500 the way Microsoft 365, formerly Microsoft Office, uh, is. And when you're talking about, you know, they're talking about coming out now with this business chat, uh, basically feature that's going to be able to look at across your entire Microsoft graph, right, and see everything you have stored in OneDrive and everything you have uh, on your Exchange server, and, every, and you know, and and kind of the apps kind of melt away in terms of focusing instead on what your intention is, right? So. If my intention is, hey, I need to uh, summarize the last month of conversations I had with this business client, or I need to run this report using, the, you know, this, you know, this Q4 data, and then I need to make a slide deck so I can show that to the investors or something like that. All of that can theoretically be started from this business chat. Now that's not out. We are only seeing demos of that. Obviously, the devil will be within the implementation, but Microsoft having the 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 data to back this up is is really where I see. Google's going to catch up in terms of AI, in terms of functionality, in terms of integration across its, its its suite there. But it's where this can be deployed and kind of the back end that it can pull off of is truly feels truly unique to Microsoft in a way that if I'm Google, I, I don't know what the direct response is to that. Uh, uh, one last thing on this. I do believe that part of the secret of AI or large language models that OpenAI has really pioneered, the secret of it is that it plugs and plays into it everything the integration in here is not going to be ham-fisted it's going to be seamless and that's going to make it more powerful and if uh, you've been wanting to get your hands on uh, some of this uh, latest stuff from uh, Bing and Microsoft Windows Central notes that Bing's AI Power Chat is available for anyone without needing to go on a waitlist. This lets you take advantage of generative text powered by GPT-4 to aid in search in Bing on the web and mobile, as well as the sidebar in the Microsoft Edge browser, like you know, we were I, talking about. I just got off the waitlist, and now I, you know, I thought I was so cool, and now I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah. I guess it was everybody now. You're you're still special to us, Sarah. Thank yeah. you, Rich. Appreciate that. <laughs>
All right. Well, lots of tech news sites offer technology buying guides. They are a mainstay in increasingly crowded categories. These can serve to distill down a market into a finite number of choices, one usually declared the best for most people. Uh, I know uh, go to the wire cutter a lot of times for that kind of stuff. The Verge's Neelai Patel just published a 2023 printer buying guide and tried a new tactic cynical consternation. In Eli's <laughs> own words, the best printer is the brother, brother laser printer that everyone has. Stop thinking about it and just buy one. It'll be fine. Didn't give any model, just whichever one is on sale, he said. Benefits include not being a physical instantiation of a business model, aka an inkjet printer. Since the article was so short, Patel padded out the article with generic chat GPT generated text, imploring you, in fact, not to read it. Uh, he just put it in there so it would rank higher in search results. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, for anybody who's like, everything's about AI these days, it kind of is. However, <laughs> do yourselves a favor and go read Neelai Patel's Verge article about the brother printer. Uh, uh, it's a laser printer. Uh, I haven't had a working printer in years. I've got a inkjet printer behind me. The last time I bought a bunch of new ink because apparently it needed it, it was like over $100. And then it still didn't work because it was clogged or something. And I was like, no more printers for me. Sounds like the brother printer might be the way to go. I, I got to say, I have an Epson printer that is literally sitting in a shameful spot in the, <laughs> of the studio right now that I took out of my office because it did nothing but jam up, print incorrectly, yeah. and cost me money because anytime one ink cartridge ran out, I needed to get all new ink cartridges, yes. even if I barely use them. It was an absolute horror show. I went on wire cutter. I found the cheapest one. It was a brother printer. And brother, do I <laughs> love the future. Uh, I also have the brother laser printer. It sits, I print out coloring pages for my kids and printer lab or labels for Christmas cards. And that's what it's good for. And that's what I use it for. And it, it just is always ready for like air print or whatever the Apple printing thing is called. It just sits on the network. I, I have it. to agree. Just just get the brother. If you need oh. a printer, you can you can do a lot worse. I mean, obviously, if you're printing photos or doing yes. some sort of like high quality thing, there are printers oh, that that it's a whole they, different thing. Yeah, it's a right. whole different yeah. thing. Yeah, so, like you're you're gonna you're in those for, people. You know it exactly. Yeah. Like you you know who you are and you know what you have to do for the rest of us. I, I, I print out show notes that I walk five feet into my recording booth. <laughs> that's all I need it for. I'm wasting a lot of ink and a lot of paper for things that I could do on my phone. I just like to feel better. Boy, howdy. Brother, I, I, I'm with you, Neelai. Let's go. Well, if you're like, I'd like to read this article and I can't find it online, do check out our show notes, which we publish with every episode of DTNS. But for now, we would like to give... Uh, a big thanks to you, Justin Robert Young, for just being you and, you know, and helping us make our show better every time you're on. Let folks know where they can keep up the rest of your work. On my politics podcast, Politics, 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 we talk about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank as well as Signature Bank in New York. And we are joined by a friendly voice, Molly Wood, gets Hello. on the PX3 train along with uh, Kirsten Grind, who wrote the, la the Lost Bank about the Washington Mutual collapse back in 2008. We talk about whether or not what happened politically was a bailout and any lessons from that dark period back in the late aughts that we might be applying to our modern day. Mm -hmm. uh, don't miss it, everybody. Um, but, but also don't miss Jordan Cohen, because Jordan Cohen is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We occasionally like to give a thank to somebody who's been with us for a while. And Jordan, that day is yours. All right. Well, Jordan and all our other patrons, remember to stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. Right after this, we'll be talking about YouTube TV's price hike. Hey, remember when it was a steal at $35? I don't because I'm a subscriber now. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I know what I'm paying now. Uh, but just a reminder that DTNS is live and you can catch our show live, uh, you know, if your schedule allows at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can also find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow. Rob Dunwood will be joining us as will Lynn Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>